Good afternoon, my friends. This is week two in the How Martin Luther Changed History series. We're going to present it on Zoom, but please remember to mute yourself. And at the very end of the presentation, there will be time for discussion where we'll do the Brady Bunch display where all of our little pictures are lined up. But for right now, let's view the presentation and jot down any questions you might have. And as before, I do want to start with prayer because this is so very important. Therefore, Heavenly Father, guide our thoughts, our words, our understanding as we look at the Reformation the time in church history that changed everything. Amen. So, again, I am not hoping, I'm hoping not to offend anybody, but it can happen. So if that does happen, please look it up in the scripture, go to God in prayer, find me somewhere, we can dialogue. I don't want to offend anyone. So, this is a picture of the cathedral at Worms. Last week, we looked at salvation by faith as opposed to a works theology. We looked at Luther's anxiety, the Anfestugen, about his going to hell and his complete frustration with self-improvement. We saw that he found his answer in the Bible and that the righteous live by faith. Paul the Apostle reminds his readers that it's not the blood of Abraham in your veins that saves you, but the faith of Abraham in your hearts. The Torah or Ten Commandments cannot save us because we cannot keep them. The law condemns us. In this second week, we will do an in-depth study of the five solas, the foundation of the Reformed churches, especially Presbyterian. Following this today, we will examine the system of indulgences, what they are and how they work. Finally, we will take a brief look at what became of Luther following the diet. The five solas guided Luther's understanding of faith. Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. Sola Fide, by faith alone. Sola Gratia, by grace alone. Solo Christo, to, through Christ alone. Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. What does sola scriptura mean? It means from the Latin by scripture alone. And this is the Protestant Christian doctrine that the Bible is the supreme authority in all matters of doctrine and practice. Sola scriptura does not deny that there are other authorities that govern Christian life and devotion, but sees them as subordinate to and corrected by the written word of God. It was a foundational doctrinal principle of the Protestant Reformation held by the reformers who taught that the authentication of scripture is governed by the discernible excellence of the text, as well as the personal witness of the Holy Spirit to the heart of each man. Scripture is self-authentication, clear to the rational reader. It is its own interpreter and sufficient of itself to be the final authority of Christian doctrine. The canon of scripture. There are 66 books 
in the Protestant Bible. The church has always recognized these are from God, 2 Peter 3.16. At the Council of Trent, the Catholics defined 12 extra Old Testament books. Protestants regard these as illegitimate because they were never part of the Hebrew Scriptures, never quoted by Jesus or the Apostles, or can they claim to be inspired by God. There are conditions for the canon. The testimony of the church, the testimony of the Bible itself, spiritual subject matter, effectiveness of its teaching, and on and on. The unrelenting focus of the Bible is to glorify God. The full revelation it makes of only way of man's salvation. Sola fide has become a bone of contention between Catholics and Protestants to this very day. Is it faith alone or faith plus something else? Luther would call, being a good German that he was, he would call that something else Scheisterich. Our efforts detract from what God has done by putting our work on the same level. God has done infinite work. Consider Almighty God in the second person of Jesus Christ comes down to us and dies for us. And we say, yeah, but let me do something. So what, it can be argued, so what if I add to something to the faith? What's the harm? If we believe that we must do something or add to the gospel, we do not understand God's gift of salvation. Why is salvation by works the predominantly held viewpoint? The simple answer is that salvation by works seems right in the eyes of man. One of man's basic desires is to be control of our own destiny, and that includes eternal destiny. Salvation by works appeals to man's pride and his desire to be in control. Being saved by works appeals to that desire, far more than the idea of being saved by faith alone. Therefore, man has an inherent sense of justice. Even the most ardent atheist believes in some type of justice and has a sense of right and wrong, even if he has no moral basis for making such judgments. Our inherent sense of right and wrong demands that if we are to be saved, our good works must outweigh our bad works. Therefore, it is natural that when a man creates religion, it should involve some type of salvation by works. Sin is the taking away from God to steal. We must repay, but the debt is beyond our ability. There's no one who's able to make satisfaction except God alone. But follow this, no one ought to make it except man. It cannot be God without man, nor can it be man without God. It needs the perfect man who is also the perfect God. This is the incarnation. The cross is infinite satisfaction for sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let me back up a little bit to that word infinite. I don't think we really appreciate infinite. Infinite. Beyond measure. Beyond limit. Well, somebody would say, maybe, not knowing it, I committed the unforgivable sin. You might have read about it. And here's the good news. If you're bothered in your spirit, that you have committed a sin God will not forgive, then the very fact you have anxiety over that is evidence you have not committed a sin. If you're still working in your heart, it's not possible to have committed the unforgivable sin. And besides which, the unforgivable sin was attributing, in Mark's Gospel, the works of God and Jesus to Satan. Well, how about faith plus works? You know, throw a little extra in. The infinite almighty God makes infinite self-satisfaction for our sin. Notice those two words again. Infinite makes infinite. 
Self-satisfaction for our sin. We are incapable of adding anything to the satisfaction for sin against God. And again, to try is shystrick. Our faith in Jesus applies to satisfaction for sin to us. And the theological word here is imputes. Nevertheless, many Christians believe that it's faith plus works. And so the fide is too easy. Okay, what type of work do you have in mind? Why are we working? To earn salvation? Or as an outflow of our salvation? Because there's no question that Christians ought to do good works. However, our attempt to add to Jesus' sin satisfaction negates the cross. Remember, the cross is infinite sin satisfaction. Nothing we can do. As a matter of fact, it cheapens it to an nth degree. It says that the infinite, majestic God Almighty need a little help. A little help. Because God is who he is. No work, great or small, can satisfy his holiness. Only absolute holiness can satisfy holiness. The next sola is sola gratia, by grace alone. This one ought not to be a problem, but I guess you know that it is. Is grace a free gift, or should it cost us something? When I was a boy, a long time ago, in the suburb town of Bergenfield, New Jersey, I would, like many kids, just ride my bike around, especially in the summer. No one worried about us back then. Just be home in time when the street lights come on. Okay, we can do that. And I remember one day I had pulled up on my bike to a church whose first name or his name included Grace. And as I kind of stood there, a man came over that I believe was one of the ministers. And, you know, as I started talking to him and said, you know, I don't understand grace. What is this thing called grace? And he said, grace is a free gift from God. I said, wait a minute. The nuns are telling me that I have to earn it. But that doesn't make sense either. So how can I earn free gifts? So, what do we do about the gift of grace? It says another free gift, just like faith. Any effort to earn grace misunderstands it. The gift is either free or it's not. This is a photo of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a theologian in the middle of the World War II, and he died in a concentration camp, wrote some very impressive things theologically. But I disagree with him on the question of costly grace versus cheap grace. This is his words. I took God's grace for granted. I tried to live as a Christian, but I wasn't making any costly efforts for God. I will make sacrifices for God. I want to live out the Bible and live out his word. If we're going to take this gift, we need to let it change us and let it cost us something. The emphasis is mine. It has to cost us something. I don't believe that. It's a free gift. Solo gratia. So, are we living out of the grace of God because the Spirit of God lives within us? Okay, Spirit of God lives within us. Or are we trying to do something for God? Solo Christo, through Christ alone. This may seem obvious, but again, it's not. In the middle of the 19th century, Mary has been added as co-redemptrix and the feast and the doctrine of the <clears throat> uh, Immaculate Conception was developed. Now, the Immaculate Conception is not Jesus' Immaculate Conception. Remember, Jesus was announced. The Immaculate Conception says that Mary that Mary herself 
was conceived without sin. I think about that. Mary herself conceived without sin. And she was given a whole bunch of titles, hundreds of titles over time. Uh, and you can see them high lit here and so forth. Well, what they did, you know, the reason why I know about this thing here is for some reason, I got in the mail a medal, okay, M-E-D-A-L, a medal. And this medal, it's kind of hard to scan, so it's a little bit fuzzy. It says, Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. And the date is 1830. Why Mary, our mother? Now let's read the prayer. Mary, our mother, I come to you with my needs and beg you to help me. I honor you as my mother and help her and trust in your love for me. Lead me on the path of virtue. Preserve me from every evil. Let me enjoy your protection and preserve me. Walk in your love and peace. Oh, and by the way, guide me closer to Jesus, who gave you to me to be my mother. Amen. Well, I remember being at a prayer group a while back, a couple of years ago, and people were sharing, you know, their spiritual thoughts and what they wanted. And one lady said that she wanted to grow closer to Mary. I'm thinking, what? Well, that's what they do. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Why Mary, our mother? The idea is that you can't touch Jesus. You can't go to him. You can't. He's too holy to have any time for you. Jesus is too busy sitting on the right hand of the Father. But Mary, now she's around and she's a nice lady. And she's the one who will intercede for you. So the way this thing worked is you prayed to Mary and Mary says, I got it. I got it. I hear you. I'm going to take it over to Jesus and we'll see what we can do. You know, it's sort of like the wedding of Cana. All right. Is God pleased with this? I don't think so. Is this, Christ, is this still Christianity? I'm not so sure. Solo. Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. And here's one that everybody should agree on. Hopefully this fifth one, you know, we can all get along. Salvation is totally God's doing. But if it is not because we work, because if we work, it is no longer God's glory alone. You know what I'm saying? So we diminish it by adding to it. All right. So Luther put out the five solas, which we still believe today as Presbyterians. The next slide will introduce the 95 Theses. What is this? Well, 95 statements. And they were not nailed. They were glued to the door. And people were gluing notices to the doors all the time. That was pretty typical, you know. Uh, you see billboards where there's something goes up and it's glued there. And you would glue one thing on top of another. And this wasn't even done by Luther directly. You know, he said, here, go post this. He, the guy goes out and glues it to the door. It's in Latin. For only to learn people to read. And what was it? It was a call for dialogue among the theologians. And copies were sent to several churches. A German translation was made. And copies got printed by the thousands. So in our language, it went viral. Nobody could have foreseen how widespread it went. Luther sure as heck couldn't see it. And remember, the owners of printing presses were in it for the money. They needed something to write, something to publish. Nope. There were no copyright laws. Okay, so what's it all about? Well, it distills down to four main themes. First, that the Bible is the central religious authority. Second, that humans may reach salvation only by their faith and not by their deeds. Luther condemned the excesses and corruption of the Roman Catholic Church especially the practice of asking for payment, called indulgences. 
for the forgiveness of sins. He rejected the doctrine of purgatory. So what is purgatory? Purgatory is where a believer, get this, where a believer whose sins have been forgiven pays for those sins by spending time in flame. Remember, these are forgiven sins. So sins come in two flavors, being you and mortal. Mortal sins send a person straight to hell unless he confesses. But only a priest can forgive sins. So, you, you know, if you committed a mortal sin, you can't say, oh, dear Lord, I'm so sorry. No, you got to go uh, get the priest to, to absolve you. Venial sins must also be confessed, but the penalty was purgatory, not hell. So, question, is hell different from purgatory? Answer, it is the same, 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 except purgatory has an end somewhere in time. Each venial sin, according to Tetzel, Tetzel was the guy who went around from town to town uh, he with a money box and the uh, dispensations, the indulgences, and he would sell these things. Anyway, according to him, each venial sin comes with a seven-year purgatory penalty. Now, each venial sin, you can commit a whole bunch of venial sins in no time. This doctrine was affirmed by two councils, Florence and Trent. And here's what we really have to emphasize, not changed by Vatican II. It's still out there. So what's purgatory? This is a bass relief of an artist's conception of it. And notice these poor souls surrounded by flame in other misery. Purgatory is adding to the redemptive work of Christ. So in other words, we say, you know what, Jesus, you didn't do enough. Sorry, you didn't do enough. It's where you, emphasis on you, you pay for your sins. It can last hundreds of thousands of years. It is the same as hell, except it has an ultimate endpoint, which is way out there. It's a place for believers who have had their sins forgiven. Jesus died for you, but you don't get into heaven until hundreds of thousands of years. This is a terrible doctrine. This is not good news. This is terrible news. This is not the gospel. The gospel is the good news of salvation. This is the bad news of non-salvation. Mom <clears throat> was more afraid of purgatory than dying. So what do you say to your mom? She was steeped in this belief for her 92 years. Because she was a lifelong Catholic, she did not have our appreciation of scripture. So verses and proof text didn't, quote, speak to her because it was outside of her experience. But she did know Jesus and his death. So how do you confront error and give true understanding? What do you say to your dying mother? And remember that with only one venial sin per day, she faced a sentence of a quarter of a million years. A quarter of a million years. Purgatory was unavoidable. Because this is where forgiven people go. This is where the believers go. Purgatory was the ultimate form of works salvation because you paid your own sin debt. So what I said to her, I reminded my mom, I said, do you remember what happened at the cross? Remember when the good thief said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus answered him and said, Today, today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, he didn't say a quarter of a million years. He said today. Well, his name was Dismas, D-I-S-M-A-S. But he is regarded as a special case against the argument for purgatory. So he doesn't count. I think he counts. Here is the current Catholic Catechism. 
And you remember, catechism is done in a Q&A format. So question, what is purgatory? Answer, it is the state of those who die in God's friendship, assured of their eternal salvation, but who still have need of purification to enter into the happiness of heaven. What? What? Next question. How can we help the souls being purified in purgatory? Because of the communion of saints, the faithful, still pilgrims on earth, are able to help the souls in purgatory by offering prayers and sufferings for them, especially the Eucharistic sacrifice. They also help them by almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance. Now notice this. These are prayers for the dead, rejected by the reformers. Where did they get this? Well, they got it from the Apocrypha, from wisdom, and especially 1st and 2nd Maccabees. So, forgiveness requires penance, <coughs> a type of payment. And you can only do it to a priest if you're a Catholic, and if you're not a Catholic, you wouldn't do it. So you go to the priest in a little room like this. It's really a, a three-part box. The center part has the priest in it, and the two sides you have um, the people, the parishioners. So you go to the priest for confession, and you tell him what you did, because there's no other place to go for forgiveness. And he says to you, okay, ego te absolvo. You are forgiven. Okay, cool. But you owe God something. You owe him something. And isn't paying God in any form a type of work? Well, usually the penance is something really minor, a token. You know, say, you know, three our fathers and ten Hail Marys and stuff like that. But in the old days, the penance was much more severe. In the Rome's practice, only priests can forgive sins. Forget this business about you going to God yourself. Uh -uh, can't do it. The church possesses the power to forgive the sins of the baptized through the sacrament of penance. Hmm? Confession to a priest is essential. The sinner must still recover his full spiritual health by doing something more than amends to make amends for the sin. He must make satisfaction for or expiate his sins. This satisfaction is also called penance. <coughs> this is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it's the current Catechism. They came out in 1999 or something. I'll show you this. A little accident. Car got rear-ended. So it was without question that I would forgive. There was nothing to forgive, okay? But I also paid the debt. And I didn't demand that she get a job to cover all this. Payment goes with forgiveness. Jesus both forgives our sins and pays our debt. This is an indulgence. It's a piece of paper, really. You can see the raised seal there. It's written in Latin or Italian. I think it's really Italian. Anyway, it's a get out of jail free card. It's a papal pardon, and it comes in two flavors, full or partial. And notice this though, for your future time in purgatory, yeah? you're prepaying, you get, that's how it works in you know, like Monopoly. You get this get out of jail free card. So later in life, when you die, you have this pardon and you simply hand it to, well, let's say St. Peter, or it doesn't really work that way. So you say, St. Peter, wait a minute, wait, wait, let me dig down here in my pocket. I got something for you. Ah, here it is. It is a plenary indulgence. That means no time in purgatory. Get out free, nothing. Doesn't count. Now, you doesn't, don't have to be a believer of all your life, but you have this. The get out free card. And the thing is, you can either get these for yourself or dead loved ones. You can get any number of them. You know, you don't have to just get one. And the Pope, by virtue of the keys to the kingdom, remember his... His emblem always has cross keys. He can access the treasury of merit on your behalf. The treasury of merit. Hmm. And these treasures from the treasury of merit in the form of this paper can be sold. What? 
No. Every depiction of the papal seal shows the cross keys. What are they? They're the keys to the treasury of merit. The treasury of merit, or how the system works. What is it? It's a great celestial bank account of holiness and good measure, merit. You remember the uh, Donald Duck cartoons? And there was this one, I think it was Scrooge McDuck. Okay, Scrooge McDuck. He had this room filled with gold. And he, would, he would practically swim in this gold. That's how I kind of envisioned the treasury of merit to be. Of course, that's a silly thought. But where did all this holiness and good merit come from? It came from Jesus, of course, and Mary, as well as the saints. Due to holiness and prayers, they have built up more good merit than they needed for salvation and extra. The treasury of merit is their surplus. Why was it useful? Because it could now be available to ordinary believers to make up their own shortfall via the Pope. So here we are, you know, you're trying to do a good life and all the rest, but you know, you're not building up as much merit and holiness as you would like. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to get an indulgence. You're going to tap into the treasury of merit and the treasury of merit can rescue those in purgatory. These merits can be sold. The merits can be applied to dead people too, especially to get the loved ones out of purgatory. I mean, isn't that a terrible thought that even right now and for the next hundred million years, your loved one will be in torment, not just in solitary confinement, in torment. And again, what this says is that Jesus did not do enough. He didn't do enough. We have to add to it. <coughs> this is a mass card, present day. You find these at funeral homes for when a Catholic dies. And you say this prayer. Okay. Notice that if you say this prayer, you get five years knocked off. Okay. Indulgence says down about five years knocked off. Well, if you got a, you know, quarter of a million years ahead of you, what's five? You know, it's not going to mean much. But read the next. If you say this prayer for a month, then you get a plenary indulgence. Wait a minute. So let's say you have a month with 30 days and you say it every day. Okay, so that's 150 years you knock off. But if you say it every day, then you get a plenary indulgence and everything is knocked off. This is a bargain. Well, you can do something else too. <clears throat> well, this is the first Friday devotion. And this is how it worked. If you went to Mass and received communion on the first Friday for nine months, you would have another get out of jail free card. So if you did that, forget about holy living and forget about everything else. You had this in your back pocket because you did the nine first Fridays. And I think we know what Luther would say. Hmm? Scheistrick. Is that person going to heaven based on doing this? This is the ultimate works theology. And by the way, it's a very hard thing to do because, you know, those nine months come around and you forget about it. Anyway, ultimate, ultimate works theology. You see, forget about Jesus' death on the cross. You get to heaven by doing this. <sighs> I don't know. Here's a good one. A relic. You can get an indulgence from viewing relics. What is a relic? Well, it is something that has come into close contact or is a part of a saint or perhaps Jesus or Mary or one of those other very holy, important people. So this one here, it translates from Latin from the bones of Holy Kowalska. Well, she died around 1917, you know, kind of like in the Poland area. And if you view her bone, there it is, then you get an indulgence. My question is, how do we know?
know that's her? How do we know it's not necessarily left over from a chicken sandwich? We don't know. Well, so let's assume it is from her body. So that's how this thing works. We take a look at a piece of her and we get an indulgence. I remember back when, again when I was in Catholic grade school. I can't remember what grade, probably around seventh or so. And the nun had a relic. It was in a glass case, something like this. And she walked up and down the aisle so that all the kids in the class could see it. Now, what was it? I don't know. It looked like a fingernail clipping to me, but, you know. Anyway, viewing a relic earns an indulgence. All right. This is Frederick the Wise. We'll take his word for it. We know that Frederick the Wise was a relic collector of the First Order. He had over 15,000 relics worth over 5 million days of indulgence. So he would build constantly to display this. And what he built was the chapel on, at Wittenberg. He even won a dispensation from Julius II. Now, Julius II is the guy who came between Alexander the Fourth, excuse me, Alexander the Sixth, and uh, Leo the Tenth. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. So this was a man who was deeply involved in collecting relics. So those five million days, if we divide it, becomes thirteen thousand six hundred years. I don't know how they set a price on it, but that's what we assume. Okay, Frederick's relics rivaled Rome's. Look what they got. Tooth of St. Jerome. Four parts of St. Augustine. Six parts of St. Bernard. A piece of Jesus' swaddling cloth. A piece of gold from Magi. Three pieces of of Magi myrrh, 13 pieces of Jesus's crib. And I didn't know he had a crib. Okay. A strand of hair from Jesus's beard, four strands from Mary's head, three fragments of Mary's cloak, the thumb of St. Anne. Now, St. Anne is Mary's uh, mom, a thorn from Jesus's crown of thorns, seven fragments of Mary's veil with blood of Jesus, a piece of the Last Supper bread, a vial of Mary's breast milk. Now I wonder, how did they ever get that? A piece of John the Baptist's cloak, a piece of the rock upon which Jesus stood, weeping over Jerusalem, a complete skeleton of a holy innocent killed by Herod, you remember, killed the babies, 204 bones from other children, 35 splinters from the true cross. Now get this, the very feather of an angel. I guess they molt. Well, the Castle Church Relic Collection, 9,000 masses said in a year, 7,000 pounds of wax burn, 13,000 relics. And again, if you visited those relics on the appointed day and paid the requisite fee, you could shorten your time in purgatory by nearly two million years. But you gotta pay a mission. This is the Wittenberg Castle Church here. And on the left, we see the doors. In the center, you know, we see the church building proper. And in the right, is the inside of the church. Now, I imagine at the time of Frederick the Wise that they didn't have the pews. They probably just had room for tables and so forth. I, I don't know. Okay, so this church then is the home of a vast, vast relic collection. So where does Luther post his theses? On the Wittenberg Castle door the home of Europe's largest collection of relics. Again, glued, not nailed. 
Luther left Germany only once. And that was early in his life to go to Rome. He was extremely popular with the German people. It was something like 90% approval rating. Who gets that? The people were tired of being bled by Rome and its crime families, and he was their champion. See, Rome actually thought that the Germans would turn him over to them. Instead, the Germans, when they saw him on the road, they would say, Luther, Luther, Luther. He wrote in both Latin and German. Okay, can you say, well, how many people could read? At that time, and remember, this is the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, 16%. Well, that's about the same percentage of Americans. He was a German's German. And because he was so German, and he gives us so many of these good little words that we can use, the Anschlussstug and all that, this protected him. The Germans were not going to turn him over. As long as he stayed in Germany, Luther was safe. Which takes us to the diet of worms. A source of protein, no doubt. Leo X is there. So as you see, they wanted him to go to Rome. And he said, uh-uh. So Leo goes to Germany. Leo X demands that Luther recant. But he can't recant. And I couldn't help that little smiley. Can't recant. He demands to be shown where in Scripture he's wrong. Say, okay, show me, show me. Right now, show me. He says his conscience is held captive by the word of God. Well, he is declared to be a heretic and a persona non grata among the people. Now, persona non grata means nobody's supposed to take care of you, nobody gives you anything, nobody shelters you, and all the rest. You're just cast out. And Rome demands that Germany turn Luther over to them. And he heads to the hills, literally, literally. In the dark of night, he is believed to be escaped, gone over the wall, uh, and he went to the Markburg Castle. But anyway, he didn't stick around. He said, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Now, this word conscience comes about, and the meaning has changed over the centuries. In German, it is das Gewissen. It means knowing. What did he know? He knew the scripture. He was, he was knowing what the scripture was, and that's what held him captive. It's not like what conscience means today, where conscience is, well, you know, how you feel or, you know, your internal judgment or whatever. No. Conscience was his knowing the word of God. And he says, I cannot and will not recant anything. May God help me. Amen. Well, what did Rome say about that? Okay. They said, Luther, you are a heretic. Luther, you are excommunicated. And oh, by the way, you will be executed. Only if they can get their hands on him. See, that's the problem. He would have been toast in any other country. Luther stays in the safety of Germany. So, Leo X, and we can recognize Leo X by, you see the, the shield here, you see the, the, you know, the Medici balls, okay, you know, Leo X was a family of the, the Medici, and he writes this bull, which is a formal document, and in that, it condemns him, and, you know, so they hand that over to Luther, and Luther says, phooey, phooey, and she threw it on a fire. From the time of the Council of Nicaea to 1517, all kinds of things happened. A lot of Mariology, a lot of papal ascendancy, you know, worship of images and relics, like I said, mass is considered to be a sacrifice, and so on and so forth. The adoration of the host. The Bible placed on the index of forbidden books. Can't read it. The cup. You know, at the Eucharist, forbidden to people by the, Constance, the, the Council of Constance, and purgatory affirmed. And then, of course, the doctrine of seven sacraments. Those who are interested in further pursuit, this is my bibliography. 
Uh, you can always pull it up sometime if there's something you want to look at more. But like I said uh, in the first hour last week, I wanted this discussion to be so grounded in theology and in history and in accuracy. Now, we come to the very last slide. This is discussion time. This is when I will turn off the share screen and we will do our best to impersonate the Brady Bunch. Thank you, my friends, for being here. I always enjoy you and I'm glad you're here. Thank you.